go. That's when I start the meeting. All right, can we get a call to order? President Zuka? Here. Vice President Jordan? Here. Director Schmidt? Here. Director Vela? Here. Director Wheeler? Here. We have a quorum. All right. Um, all right. Pledge of Allegiance, Cuban? Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public comment? No comments. No comments. Do you want to say something about Brian's hospital? Yeah. So, um, Brian is participating by the new Brown Act teleconference rules under the just cause exemption. There's nothing for the board to do. Just so you know, if it was the emergency exemption, you'd actually have to take a vote, but it's under just cause. So he'll just participate um, with all of you, and every vote will have to be a roll call vote. Okay. Sorry to make you also go through that. I broke my foot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, item number three agenda review. Any additions or deletions or uh, pull letters with consent? No, nope, hearing none, we move on to four uh, notifications and on the consent agenda, we have three items on consent, minutes, uh, expenditures, and uh, <coughs> the uh, catalog enterprise system. I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Can I get a roll call vote for previous instructions for the other council? Director Bella? Yes. Director Wheeler? Yes. Director Schmidt? Yes. Uh, Vice President Jordan? Yes. President Zuka? Yes. Did I make a brief comment? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, no problem with everything on consent. My comments on the uh, enterprise systems uh, thing is if in uh, for future updates, if the staff might say what's changed from last time around, that might make it uh, useful for, for the board. Would you like me to comment now? Sure. Um, so not a lot has changed. We did add um, express bill pay. So we haven't rolled that out yet, but we intend to. It's an alternative payment system to civic pay that has quite a few benefits. It uh, it's going to be lower cost. It's got a much nicer interface. And Allison can talk a lot more detail um, on that. <laughs> we'll be sharing that. Um, and then we've used them for quite a while, but we realized we didn't have DocuSign or Zoom on this list. So we added those, um, you know, whether they really, really need to be on there, but it's certainly transparent to add them on there. And then the other change is under Granicus, um, our agenda management preparation software, Novus agenda is uh, defunct now. And so we're being required to switch to the new system called Peak. We're in the process of you know, adapting. We're uh, taking that along. So, <clears throat> we wouldn't change this. Very good. Any follow up questions? No, thank you. Uh, uh, item six hearings and appeals. There are nothing. So, we'll move to item 7A capital improvement program uh, and uh, direction on hiring a consultant program manager. So we have two building projects that are in the design phase. Um, as you all know, no one here really builds a lot of buildings, uh, do a lot of underground stuff, pumps and tanks, but buildings is you know new to all of us. Um, I said most. Um, and so actually, President Zuka recommended someone he had previously worked with um, to consult it. That he worked with uh, was, uh, with the city of Burlingame and the city of San Mateo, uh, a man named Fred Ponce, who does this kind of um, program management type work where you know it's not dissimilar to what Juban does for us in looking ahead at our projects and making sure everything runs smoothly, kind of you know, anticipating problems before they happen, getting the right people in the room to have conversations making recommendations to hire, you know, this sub or specialist at the right time when we need them. 
that kind of strategic you know, planning and thinking. Um, well, so we initially had a conversation with Fred Quant, which was wonderful. He said he very much wanted to help us. Ultimately, he said he's just too busy, and, you know, too, too heavy of a workload. Uh, but he tried to fit us in, but you know, ultimately could not. Um, so he made the recommendation for someone that he works with frequently, um, the man Sean Tooley, and you have his kind of resume and, and project information in there. Um, and I guess, you know, Fred often passes work to Sean, they work together um, on projects. So Sean Tooley has been in the construction business for 40 years. He's done uh, major um, commercial developments for Safeway and uh, Auto Camp, which is kind of a glamping um, <clears throat> company, among others. Um, and it's now, you know, getting involved more in the uh, municipal projects as well. Um, thanks to Fred for that. So, you know, we had a really good conversation with him. He seemed to get us. He seemed like he, you know, he certainly knows the business, comes well recommended from Fred Ponce. So, you know, I do think that hiring someone in this kind of role would be very beneficial um, to us for the project uh, projects. Um, but the question, you know, what I want to hear from you all is whether you support hiring a program manager at this stage, whether you support negotiating a scope with this consultant versus um, issuing a full RFQ to multiple entities, which, you know, I do have concerns as to the effectiveness of this because it's kind of a niche area. It's professional services, so we don't necessarily need to do that. I haven't asked Sean to prepare a scope. Um, I want to you know, take his time and tell you what direction to go with. Um, you know, ultimately, the goal for this role is to save us money. Um, we talked about having a construction manager bringing them in early to the project so they can you know, do review for trackability, that kind of thing. This individual would be very capable of doing that constructability review early on now um, and would be you know, charged time the materials as needed. So it would be only the work that would be done. Thoughts? So if we went with this person or this program manager, <laughs> we would not need a construction manager. Um, he doesn't do the on-site daily construction management himself. Um, so we would want a construction manager at that point. But it would be it, it could be a different, you know, level of construction manager that would, you know, could be overseen by Sean. The way I look at this is like Kat said, it's just it's literally like if you've been the experience in vertical, but what an extension of staff. Like owners, owners, right? Owners, right? Yeah. Exactly. So instead of having Cap manage the architect, we're bringing someone on board to offload that from Cap that represent our interests with, with them, with the city, with you know, and then advise us on the work side of things. And and I'll, I'll give a little bit of background about Fred um, Ponce, who's the person that I know. I don't I don't know John at all, and I have, for the sake of full disclosure, no no financial interest in any of this. To be clear. Um, Fred and I worked together uh, in Burlingame for the Burlingame Avenue Streetscape, um, and I brought him on board. He's an architect. He had actually developed relationships with all the businesses there when they built the Safeway on Burlingame Avenue over by El Camino. And so he had gone in and he was their architect. He didn't design this, the building, but what he does is he sort of project delivery. So he understands the road construction, uh, and he went and facilitated all the neighborhood meetings and took care of all the owner stuff and just was the big picture strategy implementation, that kind of thing. Uh, and I brought him on board to help with the same relationships that he had for Burlingame Avenue uh, when we were going to go rip up the whole thing for two years and, and you know, impact all these businesses. So he was going to be the liaison uh, for that. And um, then when I went to San Mateo and I had facilities, uh, we needed support in terms of um, just we were doing a lot of small projects that have a lot of complexities with ADA and just the regs on vertical construction and space and everything. Um, so he came on board to sort of act as I had an architect on staff that was overwhelmed to sort of supplement our staff, to provide sort of the guidance. He would, he would design things and do it directly if needed. Um, and uh, but he was sort of the again project delivery specialist, if you will. Um, and 
and I was, you know, just kind of making all of it work. So it's, it's I would look at it as, and I'm assuming John is in that vein, uh, but with experience and more construction focus maybe than architectural. Um, uh, that would be you know, how I would anticipate Cat would be able to to use them, and then, um, <clears throat> but. Yeah, this is a board level decision, obviously. I mean, that's how I use them. And, 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 and Fred's still working for Summit yet. So he's been there. I want to say now I'm going to go five. Well, it took me two years to convince him to join the public sector because he was convinced he didn't want to do it. Um, and uh, once we worked through that, uh, he's been there for probably four years now. So whatever, whatever the board or, or staff is is um, waiting for input from the board whether we should go in this direction or the direction usually there is a there's a cost mentioned here there's no cost here obviously because we haven't discussed it but do you have any idea what kind of costs we're we're looking at to hire this person he told me his rate i'm blanking on it yeah, now I got you. I it was between one and two hundred dollars an hour. I just don't remember exactly what it was. It was reasonable. I mean, it was very comparable to, you know, was well, actually, it's lower in professional services. Um, many are well into two hundred dollars, I think, and that's what I recall. And I, I probably have it in notes somewhere, but I didn't. And, and you know, the idea is like, you know, let's get direction. Do you see the value in this? And then I would have them put together a scope um, and would make sure at that point, of course, I still have Yeah, I know that. But, <laughs> but I mean, you can see the value of the guy charges a thousand dollars an hour. An hour, I was going to say, you see the value, but I don't think I would want to vote for something like that. You know, that that's what I'm saying. So yeah, if if we're saying that we don't know exactly how much it is, but it's going to be under two hundred dollars, right? Right away, I say that's reasonable. You know. Right. It, it makes a, quite a bit of sense, and it makes more sense than us trying to hire somebody directly. I don't really like the idea of trying to advertise and get somebody. It's going to take us three or four months, and we need somebody on board fairly soon to keep the, particularly the Folger project on track. So. If he's got good references and his rates are comparable to what we might pay somebody to do a comparable level of service for other things, then it would make sense. And we don't have that kind of expertise in the house either. Yes. So it's yeah. like. Yeah, I mean, if Victor could do it, then fine. But, yeah. you know, if we have to get somebody from outside who's got the technical expertise and we're paying him. Similar to Victor okay. plus benefits or, or type of thing, then it's close. So it makes sense. So we've got a good body language for you. Yes, that sounds good. I will contact him and start working on uh, figuring out our scope that I can bring to the board. Yeah. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Because basically he's gonna be part-time for a couple of years, basically. For all intents yeah. and purposes, yes. Right. But I will say that getting, in my experience, getting the right people on board at the beginning of the project yes. always saves us money as opposed to trying to fix it when we're in construction. Right. Yes. Uh, or after the fact. So I'd rather, I'd rather spend time to have brains on it now um, than uh, you try to recover from something. And I will say that so far, our architects have been wonderful to work with, and I actually got feedback from. Um, the Carlos of the City of the Community Services or Community Planning Director that our project <clears throat> manager Tom has been so wonderful to work with. He was very, very complimentary. He went out of his way to compliment. Um, so we do have a very good team to start with. And, and maybe that will reduce the workload for the program manager. Uh, but then I, you know, I, at least for me, you know, my personal two cents on this is I don't have a problem uh, not. Going with our Q or an RFP, as long as you know the the reference for Fred and the, the fact that you've been in a met him is what you want as well. To me, that's enough. Um, and uh, uh, and then from there, it's going to be a matter of the scope and the management, and making 
sure he's you know focused on it and you know his job is to do as little as possible to make it successful so and it, with anything the contract will allow us to in the contract if we need to if it's not working out we'll, yeah. see that, we'll have that option so. Okay. so you have you talked to this person already yeah we've had one meeting and he he expressed to you that he has actually the, the bandwidth to yes to do that that's important yeah okay yeah uh, He's a little tight now, but by January he'll have a lot more time. So if that if that works because we'll be more work in January for sure. All right. Uh, moving on to regular business item AA resolution 24 21. Great. Um so we have Bud Levine here from Wolf Hansen to answer questions. Um and uh I'll let him give a little bit more of an overview, but this resolution basically will um, does three things. It brings um, Wolf Hansen on as municipal financial advisor to support the um, financing that we've talked about and we intend to do early next year. It also brings um, uh, the firm Stradling, Yoka Carlson, and Ralph on as bound bound on council. Sorry, I'm having trouble talking tonight. Um, and that's actually the same individual who helped us last time. He changed firms. Um, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, Brian T. Quint. Um, and then the third thing it does is it allows us to reimburse ourselves for any um, expenses that we're currently expending until we go through uh, with the financing um, on the capital files. So, but if you want to share. Yeah, I would just want to point out that uh, Brian Quint uh, was in partnership with uh, Paul Timmick for 44 years. Timmick retired, and Brian decided instead of continuing on solo, he would join one of the strong uh, um, firms that does municipal finance, and Stradling Yoka is one of those. And so, but um, uh, he he's been uh, over the last eight years available as uh, advisor to the city whenever on any legal questions involving bonds and uh, did the uh, all of the documents on the uh, 2016 issue. And the other thing I want to point out is that this resolution does not require you to issue bonds. It is not saying that you're going to issue bonds. It's just a resolution that's put in place. If you go forward with the bond issue, you have, first of all, the team in place to put together all of the structure and the presentations to help you make that determination. And then if you do go forward, any money that you would have spent on capital uh, improvements that would be covered in the bond issue out of pocket going back 60 days from today's date onto the date of the actual issuance of the bonds would be allowed to be reimbursed with the tax exempt uh, uh, provisions of the uh, of the bond issue. Again, it's an option. It doesn't require you to repay yourself for those funds. If you wanted to just expend those funds and then issue fewer bonds, um, that you, you have the option to do that. But it just gives you a lot of options uh, to maximize the benefit to the district. No, just come back this yeah. no obligations. Um, at some point, as we get further into this process, I think it would be helpful if we could just lay out what the roadmap of selling the bonds, the funding looks and looks like, yeah. um, and uh, what the board can expect when uh, and what action. So we're not sort of just doing a piecemeal. We can get kind of the comprehensive start to finish, and here's when we got to come to the board and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I hope you don't need that for the next meeting or anything like that, but uh, I think it would be useful to see the entire process up front yeah. so we can set expectations. And I'll tell you that the chance has already shared one, we start filling in dates and, yeah. and, and starting that plan. Yep. Didn't we see down at the finance committee the draft form or was it just an outline of what the next steps would be? It's a broader outline. Yeah. The one you shared, but it's very detailed. It was probably 20 items. Yeah. Very, you know, all the minutiae, which is very helpful. Very good. Uh, so, if we're going to approve the resolution, need a motion and a second. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to the resolution 2024 21. Second. Okay, we'll call up. Director 
Capella? Yes. Director Wheeler? Yes. Director Schmidt? Yes. Vice President Jordan? Yes. President Zuka? Yes. That passes. Uh, moving on to item 8B, uh, consider adoption of telework policy. Yes, so I bring forth tonight a policy regarding telework opportunities. Um, again, I want to stress that this is not permanent. This is for temporary situations that may arise, um, so it's not for regular work. Uh, this outline clearly states exactly what parameters an employee would be able to utilize the telework um, opportunity. Obviously, if there is a situation where they don't have transportation to get to work, things like that, those are stipulations that CAT can approve um, under the provision that they need to, they can telework. Um, there was none, no telework policy when I first came on board, but I witnessed teleworking happening and my first priority is to protect the district. And so that is why I bring forth this policy for you. I like this one. I like this one. Because we, the whole world was thrown into telework and then they go like, uh, everybody is doing it, but nobody has any idea how it should be done. You know, and you mean my, is she my around dad, now or is she still mm -hmm. now? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how long ago. Can you use a walk for it first? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my daughter worked for Intuit, you know, it's a huge company, and uh, even with. You know the grandiose of these companies. They they were also were caught flat footed. Mm -hmm. So everybody is out now. They're trying to bring everybody in again, and it's not easy. You know, <laughs> everybody is complaining because there was no guidelines, there was no rules. So everybody is making the rule as they go along, mm -hmm. and the rules of certain employees are different from others, and from management is different. It's just it's a whole mess. Okay. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like when we are ahead of the curve, you know, so this is what but this and and hopefully this will continue to be uh, a live document mm -hmm. that as things progress and as we learn more about human nature's desires to do whatever they need to do, we keep on tweaking it, you know. So hopefully it will serve everybody well. I think so. Yeah. Good job on it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, the only uh, comment I had was that it seemed sort of confusing that there was a lot of stuff that go, goes onto the checklist that if I walk out and I can't get my car to start and I want to tell them, tell them work today, that's not going to happen type of thing. So that means you either have to set it up beforehand or make everybody aware of what so they there, need to do. There is a little stipulation within the policy that if you read it, if it's a late notice, obviously telework request for those situations where they go and their tires are flat, their car can't start, you know, things like that. Or they wake right. up ill, but they still can feel like they can work even. Um, those That stipulation is still in there. There's a lot of supporting documents that will follow through with this. Again, it's all about protecting the district. Mm -hmm. So in regards to documentation of making sure that they sign off on an ergonomics, you know, worksheet, because I want to make sure that if they are going to claim workers' comp, that it's done efficiently. Right. Um, but for sure, the opportunity for yeah. this late notice, you know, work from home are going to be covered by the policy as well. And one thing you'll see in here, which is particularly helpful for the late notice ones, is it does provide guidelines for using your own computer limited to um, cloud-based services, which a lot of our, you know, our accounting software, our payroll software, all that's cloud-based. So, um, and uh, also OneDrive. So you can't access the server. We're not letting anyone have VPN on their personal, but if it's a last minute kind of thing, you can't use your personal computer, so. I just, I have a, a couple of questions, comments. Um, the whole, if someone's sick and that they can telework, like, to be honest, I kind of want to discourage that because I think 
society has gotten to the point that it doesn't matter whether you're sick or healthy. Like if you can work from home, then you have to work even if you're sick. And I don't want to encourage people working mm -hmm. when they should not be working because like <laughs> I, yeah, I completely agree on that, Kathy. And I think that the benefit that Midpen has is that our culture, like the culture that I've walked into in here, I don't think that that expectation is put on to these employees. And I would hope that I could, you know, portray that to them that if you are able to work, it's on your own. Like you're telling me that you can. But that's you what can. companies always say. And I, then it's like, I, oh man, I, I just like got to work. I think that we're not really a company. Like I, I, I mean, I know that we're providing a service. I, I do. I understand that. But these people have been here for some of them for 20 years, some of them for 10 years, and all of the new people that have come into this place are kind of absorbing that mentality of, okay, this is actually something that I really want to be involved in. And it's not just, I'm here to make a paycheck. So hoping that we can continue that culture, but obviously I'm hoping that staff can speak up for themselves. And if they can say, I don't feel like I can actually work, then don't work. By all means, don't work. Yeah, I'm going to still disagree with that one, just because it it's an internal pressure that people have when they're not feeling well that oh no so and so wasn't feeling well and they still worked and then you know people worry about their jobs and their employment so i really don't want to encourage people when you're sick just work from home mm -hmm. i really think when you're sick just be sick <sighs> and you know we have sick days mm -hmm. so then they can use their sick days i it's just it's something because i've seen it and this is a company this is an organization just like any other and sure. you know i love the jobs i had but we all had so much pressure to, you know, to do jobs, right? It didn't matter. When people had COVID, they were still working, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't want to encourage that kind of, that kind of behavior to just work when you're sick. That's um, something that I kind of feel pretty strongly about that because we have sick days, they get sick days every, every year. I mean, if there's some extreme circumstances, then maybe that you have to sign off anyway. Yeah. So, but putting it in here makes it like, oh, if you're sick, you can work from home. No, just be sick. Like the, I, I really feel like I don't want people to start feeling that they should work when they're not well. Having come from a company where my experience is very similar to yours, where you would work no matter what. And so we didn't even have work from home back then. <laughs> so it was work in the office, even if you're dying. Uh, and I did. Um, I, 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 I completely understand what you're saying. And that, you know, as I was like, we don't have that culture here. I don't want to bring that culture here. I but that's what that this right. does. And that's what this does. There's there's been a number of times when people come into the office sick and we say, You're not doing good. Yeah, go Please go home. We've got this covered. Mm -hmm. And so we continue that. I will say it's a little bit of a challenge in general, just because we don't have a lot of redundancy here. You know, we have one person in charge of payroll, we have one person in charge of AP, and we do have a supervisor who can cover those as needed. But if there's something else going on, then it's, it's very difficult to, to cover that. And there's, you know, there's cases we did have an individual who had a very um, significant personal loss. And, you know, she's the person who's been going through that loss. And there's been cases where, you know, times where the person doesn't want to come to the office because they're feeling that loss. But they also want to work because they want to keep their mind on it. So it's a, it's a balance, right? So it just gives us a tool, but I, I hear what you're saying. And maybe, you know, we could take a look at the language to see if there's, you know, any um, lines we want to, you know, strike, but I, you know, that's not the goal of this is to encourage people to work in sick. But, you know. Maybe it doesn't belong as the first bullet, certainly. Yeah, I just, I- Maybe I, just take that out. Yeah. Because I, it's still just- know. It's, it's just something that the whole work from home thing is is great but it's not so great sometimes so and that's the whole thing is like i lived it like for my whole career if you were sick you just worked from home you weren't sick you, so i don't want to have like have this be a line item where you know it's it's encouraged to work when you're not well and that's how I read it. 
So would it be if we just got rid of that bullet? There's a health accommodation to the last bullet. Yeah. Um, and uh, just struck out the employees willing report. That, that I, I, I think that that would make me feel better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would make me feel better. Um, I also want to finish with that. I have another question. Um, the focus driven projects. So that, like that, I know Kat has to approve everything, but it's kind of a super gray area. I don't feel like this is like a really buzzing place where someone can't take. I don't know. Talk, talk to me about that because I'm not here every day. I think that that bullet point specifically is like maybe geared towards management. I don't foresee a lot of the admin staff, supporting staff really needing that opportunity. But I think it was just kind of being broad enough to where we are covering all of our bases. So while I don't foresee any like actual big projects myself, it was better to, in my eyes, to put it in there as a possibility than that we're covered than not have it. Yeah. Uh, have you have you seen a, a similar policy somewhere else, and you kind of adapt it to ours? Or I've seen many telework policies. Yes, uh, this one actually was provided by Anson Bridget so that we could kind of customize it based on what we needed right. as a district. Um, so it does, you know, support all of the guidelines that we should be following for sure. Um, I have not seen a well-written temporary telework policy. Um, I see a lot of, it's just a couple of lines where it's just stating like, oh, if you just can't get in here, then just find work from home. And I think that that was just kind of a, we need to get something in writing and get you know our bases covered. So that's why this one is a little bit more detailed than other ones that I've seen. So you also now here you say that this is not permanent, it's a temporary thing, right? So the, the ability and the benefit to work to telework is yeah. temporary. So uh, it's, it's not stating that you can actually do this every Tuesday that you get to work. Correct, from. correct. Yeah. So uh, it, so is there something in place how you would monitor what's going on, like when this is implemented? Uh, the use of sick leave has dropped completely. Nobody takes sick leave anymore. Because if you're not feeling well, you're still working, so you're not you don't take sick leave, right? Right. So That's at cool. some point, yeah. you know, you have to pay these people their sick leave or whatever sure. we do at the end of the year, you know. So what's the benefit of it is that when we're we're small, pretty much whoever this actually is eligible to receive this benefit is pretty much within this office. Correct. You yeah. know, unfortunately the, the people the, just doesn't apply to them. Exactly. Um which you know is unfortunate that's a benefit only serving certain members of the, the district, but that's just the, the position that they're in. The benefit of that is that you know, me personally being able to monitor, you know, is somebody abusing the opportunity to telework? Um, does it seem like they're using the same excuse multiple times? Then that's just when a conversation happens. So if I know that I've been told twice by the same employee that they're in they've gotten a flat tire. Well, twice within a month, that's kind of like suspicious. Like I would have a conversation with them. Um, and then obviously that would be addressed from there. Mm -hmm. It'll be a little more work for you to follow oh, this. this. <laughs> no. I had a question on the workers comp stuff. Mm -hmm. So how, how does that work if they get injured when they're using their own home office. Right. What if their home office just is not great? And right. you know, there's some injury happens. How does how does that work since it's covered under workers' compensation? Sure. So I've um, unfortunately been fortunate enough to partake in that workers' comp kind of claim. Um, part of the benefit of covering uh, the district is the ergonomics worksheet that they actually sign off on. Um, do you have a proper workstation? Does your workstation have, you know, uh, proper keyboard? Those types of things that you would have at your general office, they're telling us that they have at their home. Um, you know, and it goes into very big detail, like do you have an opportunity to step away and take a walk? 
you have the opportunity to, you know, quick access to a bathroom, those types of things. So that way when a workers' comp case does come to us, that if they were to complain about, you know, I can't think of something off the top of my head, we can carpal order- tunnel. Carpal tunnel. Okay. Well, carpal tunnel as a workers' comp claim is actually very hard to, um, to get as a workers' comp claim only because you're constantly using your hands, whether you're at the office or you're at home. Um, but in general, those are something that we can just either provide for them. So what can we assist, what can we provide you to assist you to be able to work from home? But things like that, we probably wouldn't really need to provide because again, this is a temporary situation. I mean, I can foresee that they might trip over their own cord, mm -hmm. right? Which is probably the typical one that I would get. I tripped over my cord because I left my phone across the, the room, that type of thing. And we just treat it like it's a regular sort of conflict at that point, where it's a supervisory report. They interview the uh, employee. They ask us if we question it, those types of things. And then we send them off to the workers' comp facility doctor. I had a question. Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, actually, two things, a uh, question, a comment. My question is, well, first of all, that uh, I see it very valuable to having this policy. It looks good. My question is whether this really should be a board policy. It seems to be more like a general operational type of thing. Uh, maybe it's something that instead should be decided at the staff, GM level or some other level. Maybe run it by the board, see if we have comments or concerns. If we have enough comments or concerns, maybe we want to take take it away from staff and make a board policy. But otherwise, it, unless staff feels a reason that there, there should be a board policy, it's not clear to me that it that it should be. Um, I'll, I'll if for, only because I had a comment along these same lines. I think in this particular case to me, it tells the line. And the reason I don't mind it coming to the board is if we were to go slightly further and have a day a week, at home, given that we're already on a 36 hour work week, I would have a concern. <clears throat> like, in other words, we already have backed off on the number of, you know, sort of working hours. Mm -hmm. And I think this is as far as I'm personally willing to go. So I'm kind of glad that it's coming to the board. And, but I mean, at, as it's written right now, I think it's fine and I don't need to approve it. But if, it, if there was any scope creep in this, I would be concerned. So, I don't know if that gets to your point or not, Brian, but uh, that would be my, my my reason for not for having it be fine to come to the board. Okay, I, I don't feel that it has to not come to the board. So if board right. members want to have it, then it's fine. The one thing I, I will then go to, since it's come to us, on page 30, the eligibility criteria at the top, uh, one of the bullet points says an employee that teleworks must maintain and exceed satisfactory work performance, I'm not sure what that means exactly. If an employee, an employee at normal level of performance is not eligible, you have to be exceptional to be eligible. Um, or to give another hypothetical, what if an employee on a performance plan, they, they try and as somebody mentioned, try to start the car and their car doesn't work. Um, do they need to find some other way to come into work that day? Right. So I think it kind of goes into the realm of, you know, I don't want to say making it hard for the eligibility criteria for an employee to, to do this, to be able to, you know, use this benefit. But I think that, you know, obviously there's a difference between an employee that, you know, is efficient at their work and is doing their work, you know, diligently than being able to have an employee who might be, let's say on a PIP where we need to monitor their work or, or whatnot. And there's that level of trust. Like we're having, we're showing staff that we're trusting them to actually be able to work at home. Yeah. So I think that there's just that common trust. I think what Director Schmidt is saying, uh, and I'm only stepping in Brian because you're remote, uh, is that the maintain and exceed? What does exceeding satisfactory work actually mean? Mm -hmm. Or should it just be in this employee's in good standing or something like that? I in other words, they're not on a PIP. Right. I think it could be something in regards to, we could reward it to say something like maintaining a satisfactory evaluation. Yeah. 
And if this is meant to say that uh, while teleworking, they must maintain and preferably exceed satisfactory work performance, then I, I feel better about it. It's saying, all right, we're letting somebody telework for a bit. If things start going badly, they're not going to be allowed to telework anymore. And that makes sense to me. But that I kind of read it as to who can telework to begin with. Um, and that that so if we could clear up one clear up one way or another, it might be helpful. I think that also brings up another point. If they're working and they're unwell, they may not be at 100% of being able to perform the duties that they would in a normal workday. So if they're unwell and they do 50%, then is that satisfactory or not? Because if someone's sick, hypothetically, they shouldn't be working a full eight-hour workday. We, we allow staff to bill in less than eight hour insurance. I'm assuming that we do. Yeah, most are hourly, and so yes. Uh, so I think that there are some comments. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't here for formal adoption, though. Um, it's not like a resolution that we have to vote on or anything like that. So um, subsequent actions, I guess. Is so it is on as consider adopting the policy. Um, we traditionally do a lot of resolutions for things that don't actually need mm -hmm. resolutions. So Fair we did talk and put a debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the, one of the arguments that I was given for doing resolutions for everything is to make it easier to track because you can always look up a resolution. But there's other ways to track. And so one thing, um, still Alison Slender, but she's working on a centralized location where we can actually get to our employee policies um, and employees can track them and then we, you know, we'll have the updated date. Uh, so, so that mechanism of having it be a resolution isn't necessary, it just makes it better. Right? Mm -hmm. Would this just be another addition to the employee manual? Yeah, I think it would be a summarized version. I don't think I would put the, the, whole, thing. the whole thing in there. That manual is pretty long already. <laughs> True. But then you go somewhere else. If there actually is some sort of applicant, I think I saw something in the agenda that talked about it, that would be able to access some of the stuff on, on their phone or tablet. Okay, so I guess, do we need a roll call work on this or is it? If, if you're asking for, for approval. approval? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if I can get a motion in a second, then. Are we approving with the amendments? With amendments, with yes. The, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of, all, all of, I think it's a really good idea. Sorry yeah, if I yeah, came yeah. across a little harsh. Um, I, will, I will make the motion with, with the amendments. amendments. Second. 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 It's a live document. So it's a live document. Yeah, yeah. a live document. Can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes. Vice President Jordan? Yes. Director Wheeler? Yeah. Director Vela? Yes. Director Schmidt? Yes. And President Sutton? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, on to item 8C. We have a inserted agenda item, uh, third quarter water conservation report. Yes, uh, so I'll hand it over to Drew. Now the reason it is late is because someone decided to go have fun in India for several weeks, a couple weeks. Uh, so that is why you can have it in front of me today. Yes. Oh, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so um, for uh, a lot of these staff reports, some things I've been working on lately. Um, yeah, first first item is the uh, water demand factor study. Um, so this is um, basically analysis that I've been doing with um, looking at our water consumption uh, data um, and basically trying to develop water demand factors for the district for the various land use um, sectors that we have. Um, water demand factors are basically like unit demand factors that we can use to um, estimate how much water demand certain use types will, will have. So for example, single family developments, multifamily, various commercial sectors, um, just gives us a, a better way to plan and estimate water mm -hmm. use for different um, developments or different like land use types. Um, so basically I, I've been digging into um, the consumption data for, uh, for 
different residential uses, so multifamily, like apartment buildings, uh, single family uses, and then various uh, commercial or non-residential non uses, like uh, commercial office, uh, retail, and then uh, industrial uses. Um, so I've got some tables here showing the, the demand factor. Essentially, I looked at annualized um, average water demand over the past five years um, to come up with like average unit demand factors for both residential and non-residential uses. Um, looking at the, the multifamily uses, um, I'm kind of comparing it with the uses for the different um, uh, like apartment building types. So looking at, um, if we look at table two, um, if looking at the, the number of dollar units per, per account was kind of a way to split out uses for different size apartment buildings. So looking at apartments for like one in 10 to 10 units, those would be like uh, townhomes or condos and other like smaller buildings compared to the larger buildings, like 80 plus units or like the larger apartment complexes. Um, so it's just a good way to look at the different uses for different apartment building types. And then um, arranging the multifamily, because it's fairly substantial, is that just irrigation on the larger, or is that the hypothesis? So that's, that. yeah, that's kind of what I was digging into. The initial uh, hypothesis was that it might have to do with building age, like looking up, I, we know that some of those large apartment complexes um, are, are quite old, they've been over 50 plus years. Um, so it's just the thought was maybe those have like your very, your, uh, you know, inefficient fixtures, like shower heads and things that, may not be uh, replaced as much as the smaller, like townhomes, people who may be you know, more active with their conservation. Um, but it seems like, you know, looking at the average year build for those types, it doesn't really track it. They're, most of the buildings are, you know, 50 plus years old. So I think one of the thoughts were, um, was that, uh, that those larger buildings might have larger irrigation components. Um, so so that, that is a thought, but haven't dug in too much specifically what that might be. Another thought is that those larger buildings simply have more pipes in them, so there's more more chances for leaks and uh, might be some water loss associated with some of that that water demand there. Uh, so still, still want to dig into that further to try to answer that question. But um, yeah, it is you know, substantially larger for those big buildings compared to uh, you know the, the larger or smaller townhomes. Um, for the Non-residential factors, um, I looked at um, you know, different uses for commercial office, industrial, and then also restaurant uses. Um, and yeah, just kind of develop factors based off of average use similarly for over the past five years. Um, and yeah, like I said, these factors are gonna be used for various planning efforts. Um, some of our water supply assessments that we're currently developing, I've, I've incorporated those into those documents. Um, and just for other <coughs> planning efforts, like demand study that we're working on with, with Bosco right now. Those may be incorporated there. Um, and yeah, just gives us a, a good sense for planning for future uses. That is really good. Any questions, comments on this? Okay, uh, next item. Uh, so Water Smart Innovations 2024 conference. Um, attend this conference um, back September. Um, this is a, a, a big a, a water conservation conference that happens every year. Really, really excellent uh, co uh, conference in the water conservation world. Um, I've done it, this is my third year attending now. Um, and they just have really excellent um, you know, talks and cool like innovative ideas to like look at water data and like, yeah, specific things on, on conservation programs. And, really uh, cool too. And then, yeah. <laughs> too, yeah. Um, it's really just a great conference. It happens in, in Vegas. Um, and yeah, so just some, some key kind of takeaways that I took from that conference. Um, part of that is that I, I uh, attended an AMI workshop where they basically looked at different ways that other water districts are analyzing their, their AMI data to look at things like water leaks, um, also to like help track and uh, enforce water use uh, restrictions for outdoor water use. I thought that was really interesting because I think right now, currently, I don't know if we are doing any like, um, you know, enforcement or tracking of the timing of, of outdoor irrigation. Um, so particularly during droughts, that could be a really effective way to help reduce our water use and make sure people are actually complying with our water use restrictions. Um, so that's something I found really interesting. 
Um, I was made aware of, of a pending study looking at AMI data for a number of different districts from the uh, Water Resources Foundation. So I'll be kind of tracking it and, and looking at. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and also, I, I spoke with some folks at uh, Elsinore Valley Water District just down in Southern California. They're doing some really cool work with combining JS data with AMI leak detections to basically look at a map of all their like main leaks and tracking that with water loss as well as like revenue loss and kind of creating a cool dashboard to, to look at all that data. So that's something I'm connecting with them about and, and hoping to learn more about to really kind of nerd out all the water leak data and JS stuff. So yeah, that's something that's pretty exciting that I'll be working on um, upcoming. Um, and yet yeah, also um, that same water just uh, developed a HOA toolkit that's basically a, a package of information about ordinances and different um, uh, rebate programs that the district offers that they can kind of hand off to the HOAs to give some, them some information that they can then pass off to you know, the, the renters there. Um, just gives another way for us to directly interact with, with those customers. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's something that's a cool guidance talking that we can adapt to our own the district to use. So we're going to be uh, the remote objectives. Um, so we have an update there that has finally, finally been finalized. Uh, that was in, in July this year. It's been a very long process to get that um, adopted by the state water board. And, and yeah, so finally that, that has been uh, finished. Um, so yeah, now it's kind of like all hands on deck and we're working towards um, you know, incorporating all those objectives in the district. Um, so that's something that I've been working on a lot is understanding what the requirements are, where we are at with each of those objectives. And um, yeah, just, uh, you know, there's going to be some fairly substantial work at meeting all those requirements. But, uh, you know, in, in the next uh, quarterly report, I'll be kind of giving an overview of like where we're at with the different regulations and uh, yeah, kind of path forward for, for some of those items. So anyway, that's, that's an ongoing process. But now that it's finally finalized, we can like fully focus on all the details of that. And there's a lot of trainings right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I just attended a workshop last or this Monday um, that was really informative, and tons of them are popping up now. So really, yeah, it's a lot of collaboration with these. I think a lot of agencies are realizing, yeah, it's a lot of work, and so there's I think a good spirit of like collaboration here with this, which is really really nice to see. Yeah. So moving on to um, the. Uh, we love, so the water efficient landscape ordinance that we have, um, basically just a summary of, of those projects I've been getting recently. Um, in this fiscal year, I've had uh, 13 WELO review requests, um, and nine of those have been approved, and two completed, and then up two others are exempt. Um, yeah, these 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 pop up quite a bit, and uh, yeah, it's um, anyway, just something that I want to start tracking moving forward and, and reporting out to to the board here. Um, so last item, the, the rebate program summary, um, not a whole lot of, of going on right now. I think that's sort of typical for this time of year for our conservation rebate programs. But uh, yeah, we've had one long gone rebate uh, for this fiscal year, uh, one rain barrel rebate, and then four uh, ratio and spark irrigation controller uh, rebate requests. And I just have some charts there looking at our historical data for those. I had a quick question. What does the uh, two exempt WELO um, applications refer to? So those, I think both those projects um, found that the size, that they're under the size threshold that would require the WELO project. Um, yeah, I think oftentimes when we get these requests, they, they're not sure of, of the size requirement or just haven't read the ordinance carefully enough. So I'll just look at it. And if it's decided that they're below the size threshold, then I'll offer that, that exemption. That's usually what we I've seen in the past for for exemptions is just the size threshold. So below a certain size, they're not eligible for uh, for for subsidies rebates. Oh no! So yes, yeah, so the Wheelos is separate from the from our rebate program. The water percent oh. landscape ordinance. This is um, requiring for any new construction or rehabilitated landscape that they have to 
pass certain requirements on their landscaping plans to show that they're using water efficient plants and efficient irrigation systems. Uh, so it's separate from a rebate. Um, but yeah, if, if the project is under a uh, thousand square foot um, uh, for new construction or 500 square feet for rebuilded, then they don't have to go through the, the wheel process. It's a permitting okay. requirement. It costs the customer money. Yeah. Not yeah, so it's offset of the <laughs> rebate, actually. Got it. Thank you. Um, so sort of a tangential question, um, more because I was just looking at AMI and uh, we got some issues with AMI and backflow. I know the county here does the backflow testing, but there's uh, the new regs that are up that went into effect in July require managers to sort of surveys of different potential. You know, is the county going to be picking up the surveys as well? What we're hearing right now is we're not. Yeah. You know, and it's going to be done by certified Specialist. Specialist. That's correct. And yeah. we don't have anybody on staff yet, but we're working on that. And then we also have the ability to hire a consultant yeah. to help us. So yeah, we're, we're on top of that right okay. now. Yeah. In fact, we're at a seminar today, three of us. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. We're we're I've got three people coming on full time basically to take a look to run that. There are a lot of agencies that are looking for that specialist uh, you know, staff person to, to take over. <laughs> It's, it's going to be a, a big uh, impact on water agencies. Unfortunately, we have several staff who are very interested in it, and so they're they're in the process of getting trained. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank um, you for the report. Thanks. Yeah. Quick question through. Um, I'm asking. Maybe you, you brought to this already, but uh, because somebody asked me, and I wasn't sure about the answer on the long be gone rebate. Um, if somebody kills their their irrigation system completely um, like a year ago would they still qualify for that or they have to do it they have to apply before they shut the water off so technically um, from my understanding it just has to have the irrigation system installed like set up in, in on the lawn not necessarily actively watering the lawn but if it has if it has been irrigated, you know, and it has that system set up, then they, then they would qualify, even if it's not actively being watered. Okay. All right. So if they on their own to save water, they just mm -hmm. killed and, and the lawn died a year ago, mm -hmm. they could still, uh, or maybe they, they do something with uh, maybe a rock garden instead or something like that. It yeah. Still qualify. Okay. yeah, as long as they haven't like ripped up the lawn itself, then yeah, that, that it would still qualify. Uh, okay. It's four dollars a square foot. So there has to be like evidence that the that at some point the lawn was there. Right. Exactly. Like, which, maybe the netting or something like that, right? It is, is has the lawn been removed or is it just dead? You know? It's been dead to the point where it's like dirt now. Mm -hmm. But this, but the sprinkler system is there. Okay? So mm -hmm. if he wants to, he could reactivate it, you know. Right. But he says, no, like, just cut the line or whatever. You know? But mm -hmm. if he were to join the line again, I mean, it will probably work again. I know for other projects, we except like if they have aerial photographs of the lawn, like before when it was watered and showing it green, mm -hmm. that that can be like acceptable. Right. <laughs> okay. Good. That's a good point. Very important. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's, or it's, or it's Easter photo or something like that, right? The well, you know, we have all these <laughs> drones running all over us. Yeah. Now we need a roofer. We ask for a roofer. Okay, I'll get my drone. <laughs> Seriously? You know, Google Maps photo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Moving on to item eight D, uh, the regular board meeting schedule. Yes, it's that time again to all confer and agree if the right. set of board meetings that we meets everybody's calendar. So as you can see, there's some stipulations where we don't follow the fourth uh, Thursday of every month, obviously being around the holidays from November and December. For the most part, these are pretty much on track with. Yes. All right, cool. It's, it's hard for me to think that far ahead. Yes. <laughs> but the, the Thursday, <clears throat> it's always. It was unfortunate. It was the wrong date. Yeah. It's it's set for as long as I've been here, you know, but it has it has never happened. Maybe we were lucky, I don't know. But because we always 
No, that will always be a better on Wednesday. Yeah, something. And it was just a mistake. <laughs> we're going to change it now, right? Not even the time. No. no. Public hearing notice has gone out. Yeah, you can't change it. Anything. Julie is so no. flexible. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not this time. Not no, back in time. Today. Today on the mailer. Yeah, uh, and in the newspapers. The newspaper. Just pretend you didn't see that public no. notice. <laughs> All right. No, no problem. Exactly. All, All right. right, moving on. To the back to the agenda. Uh, <laughs> Do you need a formal left on this? Or is, I mean, I guess if no one's done um, anything else, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, item 8 E, considering good direction regarding voting and propose amended and restated by law. All right. So, Aqua is proposing to make changes to their bylaws. As you know, we're members um, and have been for quite a while. And, um, the voting is going to happen in person at the fall conference. So far, I haven't heard from anyone that they are interested in attending at the fall aqua conference. Um, and I wasn't originally planning on attending myself, but I wanted to bring it to you um, to see how strongly you felt about voting on these bylaws or, or against. Um, and, and if so, what the direction is. So, I mean, there's a fair number of changes. They did put together this nice table that walks through all of the changes. I don't personally see anything that I find to be particularly controversial or negative for the district. Um, but I was um, see looked at it, I didn't see anything that I was objecting to. Um, I guess it's just sort of a, a matter of they want somebody to actually represent us at the board meeting. Yeah. So I guess if they have, don't have a quorum, but other than that, oh, they have the a change. quorum problem. Yeah. Well, yes, in order to change the bylaws, you have to have 50% the of the, oh, the, the right. aqua agencies represent. Got it. Um, I will say that there's been a couple of things that have come up in the last week or I'm considering on the aqua even though it's, it'll be a late registration um one is i've been corresponding with their local government agency committee chair i was uh they but they have a subgroup on um paving the trench standards um and so i wanted to get the update see if there was going to be an update and i think i have joined that <laughs> working group now <laughs> as often happens when you're interested in something. Um, but I do think it's a good thing because they're doing some really good work um, and they're potentially going to work with the League of Cities on that. Um, but that is a reason to potentially go. And then there's also, which I haven't even had a chance to talk with Julie about yet, but uh, James was talking about a new law that goes into effect in January um, regarding the way fees are set by districts. And I, I, I don't know for sure if they're talking about it aqua, but if they are, it's probably a good place to get that information. So um, I'm on the fence. I might go this way. I mean, I don't feel strongly about having to have to go down and vote for this, to be honest with you. And if they don't end up with enough interest, I think that's kind of on them, not on us. Uh, but that's the thing. If you're going down, otherwise, then I would say yes, let's go. If I do end up going down, do you want to give direction in the event that I do? There's a form that I mean, filled out. I, I, I don't have any, it knows there's any objections to, to the. Yeah. I mean, I scanned them briefly after we spoke for agenda stuff, but it was. Seems to be benign. You go, I will. Uh, okay, possible update. Yep. That my mistake. Well, Oscar update. There's no there's no meeting. There's no update. However, since it, no, there's no need to talk. There's no need to talk. <laughs> you should not talk. That's an option. I do want to talk. Uh, well, no, is it a Bosco update? <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <You> tried. <laughs> so we do 
you all know that we have a new CEO for Busca, and uh, one of his uh, first duties is to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Isaac staff with every director that sits on Busca. Oh, wow. So that's that's what he's doing. My, he wants to meet with me in December, so that's it. Very good. Thank you for the boss. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I don't want you to feel on. Uh, I, I, I can't feel the love. I know. <laughs> All right. Receive report on the California and San Francisco regional water system. Yeah, my turn. So, uh, um, Allison, put on page 56 the California map. So, that, that one right there. So, that map is just kind of showing us that drought's creeping in slowly, you know, and uh, Though it's still only abnormally dry around most of the state, there is one little point there near the Arizona border where the, the severe drought uh, factors are, are creeping in. And it's, uh, I was looking at a map, but where is that? And I was thinking it was near uh, Needles, California, for a minute, or Needles, and it is a little bit south of that. Actually, the, the closest place you might recognize is Lake Havasu City, <laughs> so near the Colorado River. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've been lucky, uh, all that rain we had in 2022-2023, you know, kept California's drought conditions, uh, you know, the, the map was pretty much white, right, for, for almost mm -hmm. a year now, and so now it's creeping in and just reflects that we didn't get as much rain this, this past uh, rain season, the, the, the rain year at least uh, uh, kind of finished at the end of September, so now we started <laughs> in October, so we'll see what happens, you know, we'll see what happens with the uh, the winter storms and the amount of snow. The next slide, the California map with all the reservoirs. Uh, so what, what you see there basically it's showing is the reservoir <coughs> levels for the most part throughout the state are at their historical average marks for this time of year. You know, that means that they've gone through at least for like the Central Valley uh, irrigation season, there's a lot of water demand, you know, from that. And so, you know, we're not doing too bad. I, I took a look at what those reservoir levels looked like in 2022, a couple of years ago. So I always pick on uh, the San Luis Reservoir. So uh, right now the San Luis Reservoir has a little over a million acre feet stored. And this is uh, the first part of October, 2024. Two years ago in October, 22, it had about half that, it had about 570,000 acre feet. So, I mean, this looks a lot better than what it did. And if you drove by the San Luis Reservoir back then, it looked completed, right? The, uh, on the right side, the Don Pedro Reservoir, which is where the SFTC water bank looks. Right now, it's, uh, you know, maybe about uh, 1.1, 1.2 uh, million acre feet. And in 2022, in October, it had a uh, million 55,000 acre feet. So it's pretty close. And it's because, again, SFTC still has a full water bank. I think they, even though they didn't provide much information this, this month, uh, they still have the, the 507,000 acre feet stored in there, which is, which means they have a full water bank. So the next picture or next slide, uh, <clears throat> Hetch Hetchy, the rain. So again, the, the red line there shows the rain in the Hetch Hetchy system for calendar or water year 2024. And you can see that it's fell below the, the 30 year median. And of course, well below what we got in 2023. And again, that's kind of reflecting back at what we're seeing on the drought map. There just it wasn't as much moisture delivered with the rain events that we had the last year. So again, we'll see what happens this winter, <laughs> how it plays out. And the next slide is just the regional water system, the storage comparisons, the storage conditions, pretty full, uh, all told between the Tuolumne system and the Sierra Nevadas. And then the local Bay Area storage, we've got uh, 1.32 million acre feet stored. Compared with last year, we had almost 1.4 million acre feet stored. So not much difference is about 5% less water this year than last year at the same time. And then just kind of comparing it with the far right column, that was October 2022, when it had a little under a million acre feet, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's about 37% lower than we have now. So just, you know, had a lot of rain in, in 2022, 2023, and we're still the, the, the regional water system has been uh, fortunate to be able to still have a lot of water stored because of that. The next slide is just, uh, I, I found these maps a, a few months ago from NOAA, and uh, and I think the SFPC sh uh, shared them, so I, got, I, I like those. So this one just happens to be the precipitation, and I was reading something here recently, they were talking about La Nina, you know, I think that there's a La Nina effect that probably is going to be uh, affecting West Coast weather, and so typically, 
what they say for a La Nina effect in California is that you're, if you're in Northern California and Central California, there's a 50, 50 percent chance of precipitation, you know, being normal or not. And in Southern California, it's uh, typically uh, lower, right? And so actually what this map is showing that uh, in, in uh, you know, the Bay Area, Northern California, there's equal chances of seasonal precipitation. So we'll see again how it plays out. I, I, you know, to me, watching weather over the years, uh, the the uh, scientists have just gotten a lot better predicting. You know, they're not perfect, but they're a lot better predicting what's taking place. And that's uh, we'll see how it plays out. The next slide is temperatures around the U.S. And so what this is showing is that uh, here in the Bay Area, you know, there's a, a slight chance that we'll have a little bit warmer winter than uh, what we might normally or might normally have. Uh, and so again, how that translated to more more rain and snow, I'm not sure, but I, I just thought that uh, it's interesting to see the how, how uh, NOAA's, their models predicting the, the weather for uh, the United States for the next three months. And then the, the, the last slide that I picked up is just having to do with significant fire potential. So you see the map of California, the, the, the coastline, and then the, I'm gonna say the Sierra Nevada is maybe on the Eastern side of the valley, uh, the potential for a moderate risk of fire. And we've seen that, right? Just within the past couple of weeks, what do we have the, the potential for power uh, outages? Because again, PG was cutting power. Their, their concern was, you know, their power lines sparking, sparking fires because of the danger and the high winds that we had. And, and when I drove home last weekend uh, on highways 25 and 198, uh, I didn't notice any change in the topography. But when I came back on Sunday, I saw a couple of burn spots. So over the weekend, just uh, within like a 24, 36 hour period, there's a couple of fires that, that came about and fortunately Cal Fire was able to get to them really quick and it didn't, didn't become a big problem. But I mean, just because of the dry conditions the humidity and, and the winds blowing and just all the fuel that's out there with all the dry grasses this time of the year, you know, the fire potentials are just interesting thing. And then the last two slides just happen to, to be about uh, the district and uh, our water use. So we're in the, the downward trend of, of water consumption by our customers though, uh, September 20, 24, uh, our customers, and, and we had to purchase two and a half percent more water than we did in September 2023. But uh, as you can see, that uh, you know uh, uh, we're on the downward trend, which is normal for this time of the year. It's cooling off, and people just aren't using much water. The use of water out on the landscape has gone down. People are going to start turning off any irrigation outside. I suspect pretty soon if they haven't already. And then the last slide is just our cumulative uh, water consumption. Uh, you can see that again, we're, we're just uh, trending below the five year uh, cumulative water trend and we're on a track to be at about 1.1 million CCF. Um, the five year line is 1.19 million CCF. So again, I just, I think it reflects the, our customers and you know, they just get water conservation and how to use water efficiently. Uh, and I just, I just think that we do a pretty good job, uh, you know, with, with water use in the community here. So that's the regional water look. That's the, the community's water look. It looks pretty good. Drought looks like if we don't get much rain or snow, it, that, that map is going to turn from yellow to more of an orange. And we've seen those in the past. On the wildland issue, the uh, fire detection devices are much more sophisticated now. They were so they are detecting fire. A lot earlier than, than we have in the past. So. You can only imagine them using satellites and stuff like that to kind of help where yeah, before you had to. Using AI. Yeah. You know, so Artificial like, intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Whereas before, like 50 years ago, people would be in those uh, fire like towers. Or whoever, or whoever called, you know. Yeah. So, so a fire could be undetected for a few hours, you know, by then, you know, it, it takes off, especially on yeah. a deadly situation. So. Yeah. Uh, moving on to 9A1, Mr. Treasurer Financial Report. Yeah, so uh, we got the, uh, we're three months in, about 25% of the way through. Um, and just kind of what Brenna said, I just wanted to touch on with the water revenues on the next page here. We're actually about 94,000 behind the monthly average for the past five years, just about, uh, about three or 4% behind. Um, but we are ahead of 
the overall budget when you consider 25% of the budget of about 709,000. Um, so if you're looking at an even stream of payments, um, we're ahead, but uh, there, there is a little bit of work that needs to be done to bring up the revenues on, the, on that monthly average. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Our messaging. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the statement of that position, uh, just wanted to point out our investments have, you know, as of this time last year, they've grown from 9.3, which I think is this is about the time that we started investing in the U.S. Treasuries. Um, so they've actually grown up to three and a half million. You know, we've done some transfers from late um, over to the Zions account to increase those investments, and then just kind of reinvesting some of those funds as well. Um, Accounts receivable, the turnovers turn the turnover is increased just a little bit, so people aren't paying as fast. Mm. Um, but it's still trending in the same kind of direction that um, everything else, uh, all the revenues are as well. Uh, when we look at the budget to date, uh, on the next page, we're you know our target right now because we're three months in as of September thirtieth, it's twenty five percent. Uh, so we're actually trending at 34% for total revenues, and that comes from a uh, what, one of the items is a significant developer payment for water system capacity charges uh, of about $800,000 that we received. And then, of course, we also have significant investment earnings that are trending higher than we initially expected. Um, and then salaries and benefits are about where they um, where they should be. Uh, so they're you know on average they're about 22, 23 percent. And then purchase water is a little bit ahead of where we were at um, as compared to last year because last year our payment as of September 30th we'd only made two payments, but this year we've made three payments um, to uh, SFPC. So um, so we're trending a little bit ahead on the purchase water. Um, budget item. And then finally, I just wanted to point out the reserves on the last page of my report. So working capital, just like last month, we're at 100% funded. Um, capital reserve, um, last month we were, at, I think it was 46%, and this month we're at 87%. Um, and then all the other rest of the reserves, with the exception of rate stabilization reserves, are fully funded. Um, so we just have a little bit of work to do on the capital reserve and the rate stabilization reserve, and then we'll be all our reserves will be uh, built. Just have to build the Okay. So that that just kind of ties up the um, the 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 treasurer's report at this point. Any questions? No. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Jim here. We're first now, so we can take our time. Are you sure you're done? We moved us around, so we're not we're not last anymore. So we're gonna yeah we're gonna take we're our public speaking. It's still not my favorite. <laughs> um, we're in a we're in a that lull period between projects. Uh, there's nothing in active construction. We're kind of getting over the the big project, the OCR project that that wrapped up with. Um, <clears throat> so we're on that project. It's not on the list, but. Basically, we're we're working through uh, the retention payment and making sure all the subs and everybody are paid, and uh, which is normal course of uh, closing out a construction project. <clears throat> the two projects I wanted to report on, and then one more that we had a meeting on on Tuesday that's not on the report. But on a harbor, we're still working through a, a situation that came up during the um, during the closeout of the project. We noticed there was a there was an anomaly on the on the profile of the project or profile of the pipe. And so we're, we're working through it. I think we have a solution in place. Um, we're drafting up some, uh, uh, drafting up a, uh, a fix for it. And then we'll, we'll get out there and, and try to fix that um, anomaly. So once I, once we have it, I think we'll come back and report it out to the board. But right now we're still sort of working through uh, our solution for the, for that issue. Uh, and our permit has not been closed out with the county. Um, there was still that issue with the condo repair, which has been on here. The same sentence has been on this report for the last four months. So, which I don't like to do, but it's just basically the 
we just haven't closed it out. We're not pushing it. They're not pushing us. So um, uh, we'll, we'll get it wrapped up, but we want to we want to make sure we have a, a, a our pipe is functional and correct. So no news is good news. I, I think so at this point. So yeah, uh, on the DLNO project, we approved ASR number five. It took some negotiations with the designer. Um, so that was approved last week by the district. Uh, the letter went out, Rena, Rena sent out the letter um, la latter part of last week. And um, so we're gonna use the, uh, the, the board approved a contingency for the design of that project. So we're gonna use that contingency to wrap up the project with this additional service request essentially. Um, and uh, half of that ASR was for the redesign that, that Belmont, city of Belmont, requested, which I reported on last month, essentially. I'd say that we did our, we, we, we brought it on a little bit on ourselves, but it was the right thing to do, right? And, and uh, they should have, they should have caught it on their end. It's their responsibility, but we were trying to be good partners in bringing it up. Uh, yes, because thank it was, you, but you, you don't have to pay for it, right? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we brought it up in our in our quarterly meeting, and I, I think it's a point of uh, how we can improve our communication. They, they've had a lot of staff turnover, new staff there, and, and so forth, but we, we always got to do the right thing, right? And this was the right thing to do, it just unfortunately cost us, and, and delayed the project. We also so, brought it up in the two by two. Okay. With the, with the city and the other right. council members and to really put in process how how we work better together and i think we we're going to go back to having a pre-project planning meeting that we yeah. normally would have but like you said they had a bunch of turnover they owned it they said right. yeah we missed it and they said thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> still uh thanks for bringing our receipt for attention what was, what was the response though i'm not sure Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, well, but we're in charge for the permit. I don't like, you're not serious, are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, uh, what no, came? no good deed goes unpunished, I guess. Oh, yeah, I guess. I'm sorry, Kat, I didn't yeah, yeah. I was just going to say what came out of that was, you know, we, we pointed out that we always offer to have a meeting every time we ask them to review things and they don't and they didn't right. in this case. And so the direction that kind of came from action was, and then the city council as well is like, maybe we just have to have a meeting regardless. So now it'll be in our process to always have a meeting so we can walk them through and hopefully help them review our documents. That, that, that's a very good point. We we, we always we offer, offer, right? We yeah. say, hey, can we sit down with you? With Zoom, it's relatively innocuous, yeah. right? And, yeah. and just go through a sheet turn, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's in the engineering world, just sheet by sheet. And sometimes you find out during those things that they haven't even looked at it. Like that's the first time they're looking yeah, at it. But at least we have a document that, that hey, we went through it and, and looked yeah. at it. So I, I appreciate that it came up at the two by two. And, and Kat had mentioned that to me um, um, prior. So uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the design being done uh, by early December and then the project going out to advertise in, in January 2025. And then this, this fits in within the, the five year CIP that we have. Depending on how prices come in, we can delay the start to kind of line up with with um, our funding and and the, and the capital program that we have adopted. Now. So uh, that's all I have here. But we can I bring up the Twin Pines? Why not? Okay. All right. So you thought this was bad. <laughs> that's uh, so. At the end of our last quarterly meeting, uh, when we wrapped up our our meeting with the, the city, uh, we were packing up to leave. And a new public works director said, oh, by the way, they've given us a list of their projects that we hadn't seen before. Went through that, everything was coordinated, we're leaving. And they said, oh, by the way, we, we're gonna start on that detention basin in our parking lot, uh, in the city hall parking lot. But don't worry about it, you guys don't have any facilities there. So it's not a big deal. And Mike and I almost, we all <laughs> just are hearts dropped sure. because we have a, rather important transmission main that goes right through the parking lot, crosses their bridge, you know, the bridge that's on the other side of the parking lot and, and feeds their EOC, feeds, city, feeds hall. city Hall. Like that's the main feed for City Hall. And we said, what What are you talking about? Like, what? And so they, we requested the plans that are at 90% and all the plans that shows our water line to be relocated. 
and uh, they never got in touch with us. They never, so they knew about it, uh, but they never got in touch with us to tell us that this was going on, this project was, I mean, they've been working on this, it's at 90%. So we had a coordination meeting on Tuesday morning or yesterday morning today with their consultant project manager, their consultant, and they flat out just said, I'm sorry, we missed it. Like we missed telling you guys that we have this project going on. We missed bringing you guys in to ask you to relocate your line. And they're, they're it. So I, it, they just took it all away. They, they, they have a funding schedule, so they've gotten grants, and you know, there's three agencies that are working on this. It's an important project, and it flooded our building, right? So it's important to us. We want to have it built, right? And but we don't want to look like the bad guys because now we got to scramble to figure out a way to reroute this water so line and, main. and it's a 40 year old main you know it's not old uh by any means and it serves at eoc so it's not a matter of just you know temporarily turning it off and letting them build it and so we just got all the info on tuesday and we we're just yes, kind of yeah. digesting it and we're going to go on the field and uh like lay it out and Honestly, I don't even know what we're going to do at this point, but I just wanted to report out that it's just, it's, we don't have it budgeted, right? That's the other thing is yeah. we don't. Well, have... and separately, we are discussing and we're working on um, figuring out who's responsible for uh, We do that. not believe we I have, don't think we should pay and, that. That is, and I made it clear that we, yes, we'll have the discussions of, of what the easement says and all of that, but even if we are obligated to pay for it, we are not prepared to, we do not have the money to. So. If you want this project to happen, you're, you're gonna have to figure that out. So that is that's a discussion. The very for the first and only discussion we've had with the city. That's what we shared. So yeah, the, the thing that blows me away, <laughs> sorry, but the, the thing that blows me away is like it was just told to us in passing. Right? Like if 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 it wasn't come up, like the only time we'd know about it so is the you, USA marketing had been called for construction. Like if you, if you got up and left in a, in a hurry, it, it would have been missed completely. I, I don't even know what. Yeah, I mean that blows my mind. But anyway, it's just so I mean, sorry, yeah. I don't mean it. It sounds like they knew about it, but they didn't put it on the agenda. Is that no, no, no. I, I think I think it was their consultant had it on their on their plans. I, I don't think it was purposely. Right. I think they just missed it. Like so, they have staff turn. Their project manager left. Their city project manager left. They hired a consultant project manager. Yeah, the, the city project manager is on leave. Um, but I understand that a lot of folks on that staff are fairly experienced. Um, so I think it might be a factor of that. And then the designers are, you know, there's the stormwater basin designers, and yes, they showed our water line, and yes, they redrew it someplace that does not work for us. They no. They don't fully appreciate and understand what it means. It's not, it it's not living a fiber line or something. Yeah. Well, right? it's, did they even know the designers even know that it wasn't a city made? Like, did they know that it belonged to the water district? Did they yes, because it says relocate by others. Oh, so they thought we were. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 the only thing I can think of is maybe the designer thought the city was going to get in touch with us, and yeah, the city yeah. thought the designer was going to get in touch with well, us. Well, I thought you said that the director said that you don't have any facilities in it. So clearly the director had to look at the Well, she was She's only brand. there. A month or no. whatever. Yeah, she's brand, brand new. But, but well, I, that's exactly what was said in that room too. Well, it was, was new, you know. <laughs> but it puts us in a really awkward spot. We don't want to hold up the project. We're scrambling to come up with a design, you know, because it's an important project. There's a cost implication. There's a design implication. There's a mm -hmm. how to feed the ELC. City hall. City hall. You know the. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've initiated all of these conversations. We've pointed out that it's an issue and that it's important and that it needs to be resolved quickly for their project to succeed. So, so we'll have it on here. We'll have, you know, a report, but this just happened on Tuesday yesterday. or uh, Wednesday, I'm sorry, yesterday. <laughs> this feels like it's been, well, anyway, I, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it can be engineered. It's just going to take time and money and, and then who's going to pay for an actual construction. So yeah, not our project. Okay. Who's going to pay for it? It's not our project. Full start. So that's it. That's all I got. All right. Thank you. That's all. Well, <laughs> oh, I got to go second, so I, I got to go. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, we're going to move you back to the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> clearly, clearly, we made.
made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. After that, after that report, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rosie, uh, Rosie report. Uh, administrative <laughs> services manager. Uh, so I'll just touch a little bit on on some things. Uh, staff had a de-escalation training um, last week where we had Felicia Larson come in who's been a coach for 15 years across multiple training sessions. But for this one, we had her come in for de-escalation training. Um, my hope is that staff took even just a little bit from it and you know, thank you to Dustin for being the only one that volunteered to role play. <laughs> um, and then for the ADP, so I know that I had mentioned last month regarding the app that we had been previously been paying for, for since we've had ADP that was never utilized. Um, so it is now fully integrated into our system. It hasn't been introduced to staff as of yet. Um, another feature that I have them make live is policies. So while staff are going to be able to not only look at their pay stubs on their app, as well as request time off on their app, look at their benefits on their app, they'll also be able to quickly pull up uh, any policies that the district has. So essentially it's just a one-stop shop. Um, and again, this is no additional cost because we have been paying for it for quite a few years and now we're just utilizing it. Um, and kind of piggybacking on something we've been paying for and underutilizing DocuSign, which I am thoroughly a fan of. I absolutely love DocuSign just for its ease and the capabilities that it has for uh, streamlining documents. Uh, right now, a lot of the employee documents that we use, we use Adobe Sign. And depending on who's using it, it's a different excuse of why it doesn't work. The signature broke. I can't fill it out. The drop down won't allow me to use this. So that's not something that's going to happen in DocuSign. So I'm in the process right now of transferring all of our uh, employee forms that they would use on a regular basis into DocuSign. I preset them in regards to flowing through. So the employee actually won't need to implement that information. They'll just need to access their DocuSign account, click on the form that they want, fill it out, hit the send button, and it will automatically route to the proper chain of command. Um, let's see, let's also talk about- and it gives them, it gives them the receipt. And it gives them the receipt too. So at the very end, when all the signatures have been acquired, they get a fully uh, filled out form just for the records. So I would also have it set up to where even if I didn't sign it, it would be notifying to me if it's something that I need to put in the personal file. Correct. Um, another thing that I talked about last month was talking about employee retention and succession planning. This is again following the strategic element number one. And I had said that I was going to work on putting together some sort of a an outline of what we could possibly do, what we should be doing. And I created an outline. And the next step will be to actually implement it. Um, I think the first thing that we will probably do is get together with Misty, get together with Michael, um, and talk about how we're going to, one, cross-train and how we get all that information um, out of said employee who has been here has forever. Been here forever. And then also, um, sorry, and then also being able to uh, document and create SOPs where they need to be. So I think that that'll probably be my first focus. And um, yeah, with that, yeah. If I get that, we've been doing some of that, um, but it really just hasn't been in a very organized fashion, um, not very systematic. There's a lot of SFPs that have been um, drafted over the last couple of years, but they're not in centralized locations, they're not even things like that. So there's, it's just the next step, um, making it a lot more um, effective and systematic. Mm -hmm. and I just have a question on, um, the open enrollment. So all changes have to be made by the 31st. Is that what it says? That's just for staff. Okay. In here. Sorry. It's okay. not for the board of directors. Board of directors kind of fall on their own timeline. So you're actually extended out until the end of the first week of November. But we could actually also extend okay. it out further. Great. Yeah. So you guys are I just panicked when I saw I don't panic. Yeah. You guys receive your own little set of information. It's like a condensed version of what um, the employees get with just all the vital information that you guys would need. 
subject matter. Yeah, uh, on the first page is projects. Uh, you know, last month the board awarded the, the tree removal. So that started uh, on, the, on the 14th of October, that first week, and the, the contractor, West Coast uh, Arborist, was working on the uh, the export site, removing the uh, eucalyptus trees there. I was talking with Kirk before the meeting, and uh, you know, that up at the Hurston tank, they're going to be working next. And, and some of the trees where they're located on the Hurston property, you're familiar with it, the topography out there, I mean, it's just, you know, hills and valleys and so on. So I was telling Kirk that, you know, I was talking with Victor Fung, who's kind of managing the, the contractor. They're going to be setting a, a big truck. I'm not sure if it's going to be a crane or one of their trucks with a large reach to go off of Mezzi's across people's homes over onto the Hurston tank site to remove one of the trees. I mean, it's those kinds of things that are taking place. So, but I, I was surprised. I'm glad to see that they started soon because uh, you remember last year we were trying to get somebody to go out there and take the, some of the trees down uh, on export, and we had a heck of a time, you know, finding a contractor for this process because we actually had a contract with somebody, you know. Uh, and when Victor contacted them, hey, the board for the contract, you know, let's sit down and talk about it. They said, we're ready to go. You know, so they started, uh, and I was telling Kirk that they did take a break this week or two. Me. They had some sort of emergency that popped up, but they're they're well underway, and I, I suspect they're going to get done here uh, probably sometime before the middle of November, unless something something happens that that pulls them away that we're not aware of. Uh, on the next page, you know, I typically just kind of give the board an update on the amount of underground service lit requests or location requests we get. So are we going back to the last page? Did yeah. we not get our lead service line inventory by the deadline? Yeah, we did. We did. Okay. We did. Yeah. It, I said it was due. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We got it turned in. Okay. And actually, yeah, Victor got a compliment from um, the state. You know, uh, we had to use their, their process. Their oh, form. yeah. Their form was awful. Yeah, it was <laughs> awful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, but, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on the underground service request, uh, you know, we had 249 for last month, which is similar to what we had uh, in, in August, but it's a time of the year when uh, Belmont starts selling contracts and can't move any more dirt because of the weather. Uh, and it's just a little bit less than the, the rolling average. The rolling average is about 260 per month, so we're down a little bit, but that's, again, just a time of the year. Uh, on the last page, page 64, I just want to bring something up. And this actually involves Jubin and Michael. Uh, they're, they're telling us at one of our weekly meetings that uh, Hillsboro had reached out to them. Uh, you know, we have a couple of hydrodramatic tank stations, one at Buckland and one at Decoven. And a hydrodramatic tank, what it does is when we have a, a service territory right near one of our tanks, you know, if we don't have this hydrodramatic tank, which actually uses a combination of air in a, in a tank Especially and the water, it maintains a system pressure in there, right? The tanks, the elevation of water in tanks is not enough to give a, a good pressure there. So we use a hydrodynamic tank system to, to have a, probably like maybe a 50 or 60 pound PSI mm -hmm. in the neighborhood there where without it, it might be like 20 PSI. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, Hillsboro next door has some uh, hydrodynamic tank systems. And I think Jubin, you spent some time working with them, but they actually called and said, hey, you know, we're having a situation at one of our stations where uh, you know, I think our hydrodynamic tanks, when they're working uh, normally, you know, the, 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 the compressor, which puts air in a tank and the pumps that put water in a tank, and they might come on maybe every half hour, maybe hour, depending on water demand. In Hillsboro, they were coming on like every five minutes or something like that. You 30 notice seconds. That? 30 seconds, which is not good because you're having the power draw for the pump to come on and also the power for the compressor to put air in there. So, you know, we got a call. Know, say hey you guys have some experience you know what what may be going on here and i think what you guys maybe thought with theirs is maybe their tanks were a little undersized for their their system um yeah we, we <clears throat> they're going to look at the bladder inside those uh tanks and uh because they don't have a pump like we do theirs was designed without a auto uh, for the air mm -hmm. so uh the air might be um there not might there might not be enough air in the back. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah as Leah, typically you want to have uh, uh, enough room in the tank so that maybe up uh, as little as a quarter to half of the tank has got room for air in it, and then they, you pump the air in there, and you actually the the tanks can have a bladder. Sometimes they don't have a bladder, uh, but anyways, the, the combination of the air and the water there, you can try and maintain a pressure, you know, in a system. Like I said, it, without these. You know, we would have some pretty low pressures in, near the reservoir. You know, say, like, think of Decoven, you know, the tanks right there in the middle of the neighborhood at, or, or the Buckland system. So, you know, uh, just talking to some people who have some expertise, Jubin and Michael, and just helping our neighbors. 
And then the last thing I'll mention is uh, you're going to be seeing a couple of uh, new pickups. We uh, received some uh, Ford Maverick pickups or hybrids that have a gas engine, but they have a little battery pack, so they can putz around a little bit on, on battery power, but uh, so they'll do a little bit better fuel economy. They're considered a, a small mid-size pickup, so they're not a full size. And right now we're just getting outfitted with our graphics and we're going to put uh, a, a contractor rack on one of them, put some lights on them too, but uh, they should be out. In fact, today, Michael and I and Alberto Maldonado, one of our employees, went to a cross-connection uh, meeting to talk about the, the new policy handbook that we all have to uh, uh, adopt and then come up with a plan. And we used one of them that had some of the graphics, took it down to Sunnyvale. You know, it's four door, they're all four door pickups. They don't come any other way. Uh, and it's just going to be a different addition to our fleet. Uh, so, anyway, that's uh, my report. Any, anything yes. catch your attention? Yes. Yes. Uh, Hillsborough, does that watch with the faucet? Yeah, they're, they're probably not going to see it there, but operationally, you know, it, it puts a lot of wear and tear on their yeah, pumps. Yeah, on and off. And going on and off quite a bit. Yeah, the yeah. customers aren't. It's it's a really odd setup. So, uh, is, is uh, Paul Willis just, still up there? Make, make sure you charge them for your time, not us for your time. <laughs> we work for them, so that's why. Yeah, we, 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 we give their water and sewer. There. We 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 don't we haven't we didn't design this pump station, but uh, but it was uh I we. Brought in I, Michael I, I, I brought in Michael just yeah. to kind of talk operationally, but um, one of the one of the things when you're part of a city is like they they don't have dedicated super dedicated smaller city or town is you don't have that super dedicated personnel to for what like we do with Michael and our staff right like they just have a lot of turnover so they just you know they didn't realize that they had to maintain their pneumatic system by putting air into it. Yeah, well, Paul is. Well, he was pretty good. He's a great guy. He's a good, good partner. Guy. No, no, I, absolutely. I'm talking about the field, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, ops yeah. staff. Yeah. Paul, Paul's a. I just had. I just had lunch with him actually. Yeah. Days ago. So great guy. Good guy. Yeah. All right. Uh, All right. So it inadvertently got stapled to the mm. back of the uh, found it. So, um, so there's a couple things on here that, or that are not on here, that just happened, kind of materialized. Um, I think Monday I got an email from CSDA saying they were setting up a little roundtable discussion with um, Assemblymember Pappen um, this morning um, and would we be interested. So um, we said yes, of course. And Kathy and I both um, got on the call with um, Assemblymember Pappen and then only two other districts of the coordinator from CSDA. So we were able to share with her what's going on with us, our needs. Um, and she was, you know, shocked a lot about the climate bond um, bill and that it was something that passes um, on the ballot here in a couple of weeks, um, that there should be a lot of opportunity for our projects um, and that she'd be very supportive of that. So that's great news. Um, offered, right, her district director offered, offered help if we needed help writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then very similarly um, on Monday, I was holding off kind of sharing this out just because Senator Becker tends to reschedule multiple, multiple times. Um, but we do have him scheduled to come um, to Dairy Lane on Monday to tour in person. So um, at 11, you said? Yeah, at 11. Um, so that will be the plan. He will come. We'll we'll share, um, you know, walk around the site, talk to him about our plans for both Folger and Dairy Lane, as well as our CIP. We'll share um, the various, you know, nice written materials and stuff that we have, as well, and our plans. So, and um, continue engaging him so that he can also support us um, with various funding mechanisms. So that's just part of the strategy to hopefully not have to raise customer rates um, for it. Um, and then we had our two by two meeting, which went well, very well. Um, one of the key takeaways was we got direction, official staff direction, you know, direction to staff to work on an MOU regarding their trench standards. Um, so I've reached out and talked with Nisha. I also have uh, the, the public works director, Nisha Patel. I was on director there uh, Tuesday. 
Um, she has her own French standard that she developed at a previous job that she was actually intending, a different one that she's intending to roll out um, with payment moratorium. So she's going to send us that um, and that's what she wants to start from. So we haven't seen that yet, but at least, you know, we will have a conversation when we go forward. Very good. Not there any other takeaways from the two by two that that's pretty big because they've been kicking that can down the road for years. Yeah. And so just having it be talked about at the two by two is much appreciated. <laughs> so. <clears throat> it helped because we kind of got Tom McEwen to make her point for us before we got to that item. And then he just told us how different we were from at and and pg &E and everyone and how we should be treated differently because we are a partner in the community and really about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. clears throat> well. Um, our audit is underway. Um, actually, after this was published, uh, the draft audit probably won't be done until December. It says November here, um, but we still hope that we should be able to have, be able to bring it to the board um, by January with the finance committee meeting before that. So we'll wait until we actually get the draft to schedule that finance committee meeting um, so that we're not rescheduling and rescheduling, but that's the goal. Uh, it'll be earlier than it was last year, which is good. And we'll try endeavor to make it even earlier next year as we get continue working with this auditor. Um, there was that city council meeting hearing in San Carlos where they talked about uh, Cal water rates. So I kind of did summarize here um, the concerns that were brought up. You know, the good news from my perspective is that the concerns that both the council members and the um, uh, residents had really don't apply to our situation, right? They had to do with the uh, lack of transparency from Cal Water and being a CPUC regulated entity and not Prop 218. They have very different requirements, very different practices. Very different in many ways. Yeah. Did anyone else watch it? I watched it, yeah. yeah. It, it was remarkable as to, it was all the political agenda associated to the PUC Absolutely. as opposed to looking at what the cost factors were and how they were being applied to the rates. So they immediately said, oh, well, we are changing it to create a special class for people who only use one, two, or three units. And they will pay half of what the people in the next tier will pay. Less than. Well, less than half. It's yes. remarkable. It, it was. And why was this? Well, because they're, you know, mostly people are living alone or they may not have much income or whatever and therefore this is serving the lowest users and it didn't make any real sense because there are a lot of people living in huge houses by themselves and don't use a whole lot of water or a lot of money to pay for it and stuff oh so and then the other part of it was that people were very upset that having six kids in the house meant that they had to pay more per unit than people who only have three kids in the house or two kids. That's been happening for 30 years. The, the marginal cost of their water was at the high end type of thing. So, and it didn't go back to anything else. It was just sort of, you're it's discriminating us because we have kids. It, it was an interesting perspective. But it had nothing to do with how they got the costs, how they did the rates. But I, only, I really appreciated the fact that the council really understood that Cal Water was not being transparent with them on what cost factors were being incorporated right. yeah. and how that's the what I took was, yeah. Yeah. because you know they said oh yeah the cost factors apply to these three different systems and then your rates are set based on your actual usage. And it didn't say that whether they were different from the other systems in the, the regional cost factor basis or what. So it was very bizarre. And there are a lot of comments where if folks were looking at Cal Water rates, Sorry, Carlos versus Cal Water rates in Bear Gulch, Atherton, 
and uh, Los Altos Suburban, um, and pointing out that the rates in Atherton and Los Altos are lower than in San Carlos on a per unit basis, and they had good issues in that. And there was also another resident who pointed out that, and I had forgotten this, but at one point in a uh, last couple of cases, a couple of cases ago, they actually merged the Bayshore District, which is the, the Peninsula District, with Redwood Valley up in Sonoma because Redwood Valley was in trouble. So it does seem, and they try to wave their hands around and not, but they're actually, the, the districts here are subsidizing Redwood Valley because they were in financial difficulty. So they lumped them together for eight purposes. And so you see, obviously, it proves it allowed it. So that was also brought up, which um, yeah, residents weren't super thrilled about. There was one resident who lives very near our district who said, you know, he was fed up with hot water and he just wanted to dig a trench and join our district. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'll give him the backup. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to um, So, um, grant writing firm. So, I have been talking with a firm that actually Matt Off recommended, City of Palo Alto. Um, they seem really wonderful, really good recommendations, really good to talk to. Got us a $16.5 million grant. And they said they only spent $20,000 to write that grant to get $16 million, which is a pretty good return. That's yeah. an investment, I think. Yeah. So, the initial the scope that we're we're talking about um, is basically they'll spend some hours getting to know us and our CIP and our projects and everything that we got going on, and then on a monthly basis they'll look at all of the new grant programs and things that have come out uh, to find them for applicability. Then if they find a program that they, you know is worth going for, then we'll figure out you know the scope of doing another task order to to proceed with that work. Um, but that way you know it's just there are so many hundreds of grants to state that are all these levels and you just need to spend so much time getting to know them and understand them. So having a firm that does that is going to be so beneficial to us as well as the time to go for them. So yeah, part of that strategy, really trying to find tax basis of dollars to supplement our I mean, projects. I'd, I'd be surprised if at some point they couldn't find something that would help with every lane, you know, and all that. We just need climate one. mitigation, critical infrastructure, whatever. Yeah. So that's good. I did have one proper rule to middle. We did get that in on time. Um, and I think nothing else really these, these super jumps out here. Chad, the, the grant writing firm, do they kind of specialize in like our field of work or, or in the whole spectrum? Uh, they're fairly broad. Yeah, they mostly do utilities. Yeah. They're because we get through NCPA, the Northern California Power Lines. And I, you know, I have been asking. Everyone I talked to basically for the last two years for referrals for good grant writing firms, and no one has a really good referral. There's a lot of companies that do it, but none that really specialize in it. There's a lot that will put together tools, which are just spreadsheets listing the grants that you can also go to the state and federal websites to scroll through, but they really don't do the work of helping you figure out what. And Paul also, by the way, just you know, from a competitive standpoint, uh, we were able to use them so it was quote unquote sole source, but it wasn't because it was a piggyback contract on the selection process that it's mm -hmm. And so they were sort of uh, they were the or they were the selected consultant we relied on their RFP for for using it. Let's see what we have is under GM signing authority, so we're we're working with that and doing task order for any like actual <laughs> Um, the only other thing I just wanted to point out is, so you're used to seeing the three month look ahead for board meetings. Um, I did add kind of for this month, um, just the you know topics for finance committee to be scheduled, and then we have the ad hoc board appointment committee. So you know these aren't scheduled yet, but these are just the things that are, that are coming up that we'll want to think about at the level. So just keep up with the app. Oh, and I almost forgot. So this uh, you have in front of you, and, and Brian was emailed it. Um, it did go in the package because we just, um, so it's still in draft, but uh, this is draft as of today. Mm -hmm. Been working with um, John Davidson, mm -hmm. who is still on. There he is. Um, so, this is the outreach material to schedule the uh, open houses for Folger. There's a cover letter, and then the next four pages will be printed as a, um, you know, a, a four page brochure. But this is explaining the project to the neighborhood and inviting them to the open house. 
I think it's it's turned out really well. There's a couple little typos in here that I've already passed on, but um, I think we're very close uh, to finalizing this, and then it's a matter of just scheduling the dates and, and getting the list from the city. And so, if you have any feedback, certainly I don't expect you to be able to read it in detail now, um, but if you could take a look and let me know. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, moving on to director's reports. Uh, let's start with Brian online. Nothing to report. Director Ella? I, uh, I participated in that two by two meeting, which we talked a lot about, so I don't need to elaborate on that. It was very timely that we, we, we got it done for this year as well. We promised ourselves that we have to meet, keep on meeting. Once you well, so, and then with, with Kathy on the council, we'll have to it. So, <laughs> it has not have continued. <laughs> uh, we'll make sure that it continues to take place. Absolutely. Great. Um, the HIA was this month, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, went to, I, went I think to have one monthly, but you know. Yeah. Well, they had to take a break for the summer. That's so, true. I, I attended that luncheon, but it was so long ago. I, I thought the city of Belmont was supposed to present, but I don't know if they necessarily really did. Um, they had the consultant talking about the detention basin. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. we all, that's when I found out about the detention basin. Yes. Oh, I feel like that was so long ago. Um, yeah. So, and then the two by two. And then during the HIA, I had brought up since I've been canvassing every weekend, I was up on, I think it's Altura, is that where the export tank Altura, is? Yeah. And one of the neighbors that he, you know, I said that I'm on the board and he was very unhappy that the fence was damaged and was concerned about break-ins and, you know, what people could do to the tank. So uh, they went and I think- We're, we're getting pricing right now on uh, making fence repairs there. Yeah. yeah. So. I went and visited him over the weekend to make sure that he, his complaint didn't go, you know, mm -hmm. without, you know, without any follow up. So I said, I wanted to do it. And he said, thank you. And he said, I see you're cutting down the trees now. And I said, yes, we're, you know, we did an evaluation of all of the trees and all of our properties and had an arborist come out and determine which ones we need to remove. So he was very appreciative that um, we, you know, we answered his complaint and and I was like, I'm driving to his house and I'm going to follow up because I didn't want him to think because I had no other way of contacting him but then a knocking on his door. So I did go and he was very appreciative. So you had a large family. Yes. <laughs> and then I did, I did participate on the call with assembly member happened today. And that was good because I think we will get some additional support. Um, I, I'm friends with her district director. So he said, definitely if that bond passes, we should be applying for both the 101 and also the Dairy Lane project. <clears throat> yeah. And they offered they offered help if we needed some help with, with writing. So and Kat was great because she also offered the assembly member any type of help they need with what's going on in San Carlos. And yeah. the San Carlos City Council did yeah. say that they were going to go to Kevin and Becker um, and see if they can. Experience. <clears throat> Good. I went to HIA. Okay, uh, item 10A customer objections. All right, so we actually have communication this time. Wow. Oh. So, um, uh, as you recall, you passed Ordinance 128 that gives customers um, an opportunity to uh, not only just do a pro 218 protest that just says, I protest, but to give meaningful feedback of what their objections are to our rate changes um, in writing. And so um, we received a few. This is obviously to date. They still have to, uh, it's uh, November 8th, to continue submitting them and, and for us to receive them. Um, and so we've gotten 
five letters. Um, and so you have the letters themselves as well as the responses. Um, you should note that actually only two of these letters actually cite Ordinance 128, which was a requirement in there. Um, and also some of the letters don't clearly articulate a desired outcome that they want to see, um, which is also a requirement. But because this is a new ordinance and a new process for the district, um, and in the spirit of being fully transparent, you know, we're choosing, and the fact that we've got five, not 50, right? Um, we're choosing to go ahead and prepare responses um, to anyone who's, you know, written a, a, a meaningful, you know, comment on our rates. Um, and we're also considering them a Prop 218 protest, even if they didn't submit separate letters, they did say, we're just going ahead, take them in the spirit um, that we, uh, that, you know, we, we interpret. Um, and, you know, so who's a, of those letters for the ones that are clearly just Prop 218 of, uh, protests, we've got nine protests. So that's where we are. Um, so the table here is a summary. Basically, you know, what we do is we get a letter, we read it, and we kind of distill their concerns into questions. And so these are the questions that we've interpreted their concerns to be, and then um, how many uh, letters have had that particular concern. So, you know, how the rates were determined has come up in three letters, um, and then there's the other individual ones. Um, one benefit of framing these as questions um is you know it's it it, it uh obviously rewords to them um our concerns but then we've been updating the faq on the website with that as well so there'll be a few more that'll be added tomorrow that are on there we've already added a couple so of course we're working closely with <coughs> julie's team maybe driving her a little bit crazy i don't know <laughs> um back and forth on these responses but um you know you certainly you'll have them here you can spend some time reading them if you want to if you have questions let me know um we will give you another packet like this after the close and i'm intending to email that packet out ahead of time for the board meeting so you'll have it it well in advance not just at the board meeting before the public hearing and again if there's any criticisms or concerns that you don't have time to look at it consider it and i think that'll give you plenty of time so that's how i'm addressing it And the, the responses are all going to be made available on the website. Not the response not the letters. letters. So, so they have, as an FAQ format of it is. Yeah. So some of these were already written as FAQ, you mm -hmm. know, FAQs, and then as we develop new ones, we're adding them to the website. And I guess where I'm going with that is, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how are we, I, mean, I like the fact that we're establishing the record. I'm wondering whether or not, is there any, any disclosure that we want to do with your responses other than just FAQ? I don't know if there is, I'm just, other than sharing the answers. Like it's already an agenda item. This is the this yeah. agenda item. On the it's board, in the right? packet. Uh, anything that's substantive is becoming an FAQ. FAQ. And, and actually, we really haven't gotten anything substantive or worrying from the viewpoint of someone attacking the rate model. Mm -hmm. So sure. it's, so far, so good. Okay. Any questions? Hearing none, we will close the open session. We can mean in closed session after a five minute break. Bio or whatever. On closed session personnel and chance to vacate. Like, don't work when you're sick, thing. I'm gonna call. Yeah, I'm well, just gonna manage your own policy now. You've got the whole no action. Perfect. Say it again. again. There's no reportable action. Okay, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Ryan. Almost a record. All right. Bye, Ryan. Almost. Yeah.